Bernstein. Okay, hi, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, tonight we're gonna have a little lecture here on who the German American Bund was, um, how, what they accomplished and didn't accomplish, um, and the people who helped bring them down. I'm gonna, let me go to, oh, screen share, screen sharing, uh, screen share. Okay, there we go, there we go. Microsoft PowerPoint, boom. Okay, whoop, it's not going on. Uh, your screen show. Oh, wait, I know the problem. I'm sorry, that's my problem. Uh, slideshow. There we go. Play from start. Okay. Fritz Kuhn and the rise. You got it? Can you got see it. it? Okay, terrific. Okay. So, Fritz Kuhn and the rise and fall of the German American Bund. Now, how did they get started? Well, German Americans after World War One and in World War One were an oppressed minority, you could say. Um, these are clips from newspapers of the war era. Eliminate German, Hun language, you notice that slur Hun, will be abolished in high school, little demand for it now. And the majority of parents wish their children to study other tongues. Uh, they, it, it was terrible. They, they pulled Beethoven from symphonies because he was German. Um, Food names were changed. Uh, sauerkraut, sauerkraut became Liberty Cabbage, as we know. Um, the Wiener Schnitzels became hot dogs. Those are, that one kind of stuck. Um, and as you can see the other clip, um, to German and Austro-Americans, men and women of Germany and Austrian blood, we ask you to remember that this is your country now. You no, owe no allegiance to any king or kaiser, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just a reminder that you are in America. Well, the two things came out of this, and the, rep the oppression continued after the war. Uh, the German Americans were, in some cases, forced to kneel in public squares and kiss the American flag. It was uh, incredible. So two, two things came out of this. One was the Van Steuben Society, which was essentially created to rehabilitate the image of Germans in America. Van Steuben, of course, was the uh, Hessian leader during the civil, excuse me, during the American Revolution. Um, the other side was Germans that were looking to what was going on in Germany. And of course, it was the rise of Hitler and the National Socialist Party. They began forming groups that were inspired by uh, Hitler. One was called the, uh, one was called the Teutonia, the Teutonia Association. Uh, and they had national presence, Teutonia. From them out, uh, excuse me, from Teutonia became the Friends of New Germany, which formed in the late 20s, early 30s. They were, again, loyal to Hitler. Uh, they sent money to Hitler uh, to support his war effort. But the Germans were, at this point, keep in mind, we didn't know Hit, who Hitler was or what he was going to accomplish. I think Ken Burns covered that pretty well in his documentary. You know, Chamberlain, the prime minister of England, thought we might be able to work with him, as did the uh, American ambassador, Joe Kennedy. Uh, Roosevelt was trying to figure him out. So, but the Germans wanted to make sure that they weren't seen as trying to, you know, fiddle around in American policy. So they informed the Friends of New Germany that they had to close shop. Uh, who wanted to be a friend of New Germany, particularly when things were really starting to heat up there? So at Christmas of 1930, uh, 1936, or excuse me, Christmas 1935, they closed down the uh, Friends of New Germany. From this came the German-American Bund. There was st people still wanted to band together, and you know for good reason. The prejudices were still going on, and they were still becoming interested in what Hitler was doing. Fritz Kuhn, Bundesführer of the German American Bund, he became the leader. He originally was from Germany. He was uh, he was uh, he, he was a veteran of World War One. Uh, he was arrested and spent time in a prison. Uh, and a lot of his career sort of mirrored Hitler's career. Uh, they were both blinded uh, partially um, during the war, gassed. They both stood a little bit of time. 
and they both became interested in fascism. Now, Kuhn was caught stealing from his employer. He worked at a, a, a factory that produced cloth and bolts and things like that. Well, they were coming short on bolts. The, the lines of bolts were coming short. People weren't able to sell them because they weren't as big as they promised to be. So the owner discovered that Kuhn was cutting the bolts short and smuggling them out and selling them. His father begged, begged the owner of the factory, please don't have my son arrested. He's already been in jail once. Uh, he was in jail for stealing from his fellow students. He was stealing out of their coats and things. He was spent six months in jail. So the owner took pity on him and he was sent to Mexico. Now this was a common for a lot of young German American, a lot of young German immigrants, they would go to Mexico and eventually they would move to America. For a while, Kuhn worked in Mexico City as a chemist. He had a master's degree in chemistry. Um, he taught German at, um, at the University of Mexico City. And he was told by some friends, there's a lot of jobs in Detroit for you. Well, he, so he went to Detroit and got a job with Henry Ford. Henry Ford, of course, the notorious anti-Semite who published a magazine called the Dearborn Independent. Within the Dearborn Independent, he published a series called The International Jew. The International Jew, of course, was the story of how Jews were taking over the world. Um, they were influential in the press, in media, in business, all the, all the tropes that, you, you know, that have come up over the years. And it was published in a book. Now, Kuhn worked as an x-ray technician at Henry Ford Hospital. Now, there was a rule at Henry Ford Hospital, no Jewish doctors. So it must have been something of a utopia for him. He didn't have to work with uh, Jews, but he would romance. He had a lot of romances with women who worked at the factory and at the hospital. Well, there's his family, his son, uh, Walrut, his daughter, Waltruth, and his wife, Elsa. He would, in the meantime, while he was married, he would slip into broom closets and have his little romances. Then he became a member of the Friends of New Germany and he slipped into the closets to practice speeches. He saw himself as a leader and he did. He became the leader of the Detroit uh, branch of the German American Bund. Eventually, or exactly the German, of the Friends of New Germany, excuse me. And it was kind of split into three areas of the country. There was the Eastern Gau, they called it, GAU. There was the Central Gau, the Midwest Gau, which Kuhn became in charge of. And then there was the Western Gau, which was headquartered in Los Angeles. Kuhn decided he wanted to be the leader. And he insisted to leaders of France and New Germany that they had to make themselves more American if they wanted to survive. Not Friends of New Germany, but something with the word American in the title. Well, after the Friends of New Germany disbanded, Kuhn was able to marshal all these former members who still wanted a place to be, a place where their interests would be you know, accepted. And of course they were looking back to Hitler and he renamed it the German American Bund with again, the emphasis on American. He became the Bundesfuhrer. Now that means essentially the Bundesfuhrer. The head of the Friends of New Germany was the president because nobody else could be called Fuhrer but Hitler. <laughs> Still, Kuhn wanted to be a Fuhrer. So he called himself the Bundesfuhrer. That was acceptable. Now as Bundesfuhrer, they had something called the leadership principle. You only did whatever the leader said. He was in charge of everything, all the rules, all the intricacies, and all the money. Keep that one in mind, that latter one. We're going to revisit that soon. Kuhn was, he had a genius for organization. If this had been a business in the mid 1930s, he would have been a successful businessman who would, you know, brought this dying, wheezing organization into a vast and powerful organization. They had their own publishing wing, which produced pamphlets and a newspaper. They had a what were known as family retreats that were looked like any kind of family retreat. Uh, with uh, like every weekend was Oktoberfest. They had Camp Siegfried was in New York on Long Island. There was uh, Camp Norland in New Jersey. There was 
Camp Hindenburg up in Wisconsin, in Grafton, Wisconsin, outside of Milwaukee, if any of you are familiar with that area. And then there was one in Los Angeles as well. Uh, there, were, there were numerous camps across the country. Those were the four major ones. These camps were, of course, every weekend, as I say, was Oktoberfest. There were trains, special trains that came from New York City to Long Island every weekend. There was a special train that went from Milwaukee to Grafton, Wisconsin, where this thing was. Um, and they would march through the towns and to their German-American Bund camps. Now, their uniforms, as you, you'll see in a moment, they were modeled on the Hitler uniforms, on the SS uniforms. They were um, brown uniforms, the brown shirts with the Sam Brown belt, that you know, black you know, military-style belt. And as you can see, Kuhn was a, well, let's call him a fleshy man, um, portly accent, portly belly, portly jowls, thick accent, and very thick glasses. And yet he had this magnetism to him that brought him both this leadership quality as well as the women. Now, after he formed the German-American Bund in 1936, they decided they had to get the blessings from Hitler. Well, that was the year of the 1936 Olympics. So they took a delegation to Germany. Now, a former friend of theirs, a friend of New Germany, had repatriated back to Germany, and he was able to get them a meeting with Hitler. They marched in a parade that Hitler was reviewing from the Reichstag. They were, they were feted and given special dinners, things like that. And then they were arranged a meeting with Hitler. Now, you're never gonna hear this sentence again. To Hitler's credit, <laughs> you'll never hear that one again. He did not know who they were. This was a standard, you know, one of those grip and grin photos where politicians meet people, take a photo, you know, smile, and on to the next group. Well, you know, Hitler, of course, would ask, who are these people? And, you know, what is it? What are they doing? Et cetera, et cetera. They came in, Hitler shook their hands and was introduced. They presented him with something called the Golden Book, which was a book of all the things that they had been doing and the history of Germans in America, and a donation to what was called the Winter Fund. Now, the Winter Fund was a German charity, I guess is the best word, that was supposed to go to the poor and disabled to help them out during the winter. Well, we know what happened to the poor and disabled. Um, additionally, the SS troops went to people's houses and more or less said, you're contributing to the Winter Fund. It was you know, more or less blackmail if you wanted, if you didn't want to get killed or beaten up. Um, and so Kuhn and everyone gave a tribute to the Winter Fund. Now, Hitler was told who they were, shook hands. And as, as you can see the uniforms there that are very similar and the, the ramrod straight because they're in the presence of the great Hitler. Mm -hmm. Hitler shook their hands and said, go back and continue your work. Now, Kuhn thought this was a blessing from Hitler. He was now the leader of the German-American Bund, and he was had a blessing from Hitler, they were off to do Hitler's work in America. And again, this was just something him, Hitler simply said. He had no idea who these people were. He said, go continue your work as you know, something nice. And off they went. Now that fall was the election for president. They decided to, in order to really solidify their place in America, they needed to make a presidential endorsement. Well, they couldn't endorse Roosevelt because everyone knew Roosevelt was a secret Jew who went by the name Rosenfeld. This, of course, was one of the, the standards that was involved with the German-American Bund. Uh, there was a second man from a third party who was running. Um, he had absolutely no support. He was of German background. His ancestors were from Germany, but they dismissed him saying he was German in name only. So they went with Thomas Dewey. Not, to, excuse me, not Thomas Dewey. Um, who was the, I'm blanking on the name. Who was the third one who ran against uh, Roosevelt that year? Um, Landon, Alf Landon. And they, they endorsed Landon. Now, Landon, of course, wanted nothing to do with him and he renounced it. And meanwhile, the, the Americans were saying, who are these people and why are they endorsing an American candidate? And the German officials were contacted, said, why are you getting involved in our politics? 
Now, this is the last thing Germany wanted. So word was given by the German consulate, said, don't do this. No involvement in the American elections. Meanwhile, the organization grew and grew and grew. These were some of the camps, as I said. You can see they're giving the, you know, the Zig Heil salute. Um, they would not say Zig Heil. They said free America in the same cadence as Zig Heil. You can see the kids are marching. They have the American flags and not so seen because they aren't blowing out. Those were the German flags, the Nazi flag with the swastika on it. Now the children, they went and they did, it was like Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. They were the equivalent of the, you know, the, uh, the youth corps in Germany, the Hitler youth, the boys camps, the girls camps. Now it looked like standard stuff. You know, there was canoeing, there was archery, there was all kinds of things. These kids were exploited. There's no question, these kids were exploited. Um, you can see on the second photo behind the boys, there's a cabin, a uh, cottage there. Well, they built it. German American Bund didn't want union labor. The union, of course, was rife with Jews and they didn't want to pay for, and I'm being sarcastic here, obviously. They didn't want to pay for union labor either. So they had the kids build these things. When parents complained about this, and parents weren't allowed in to see their kids, but you know, word trickled out. And when parents complained, the response was, fine, we'll kick you out of the bund and you're on your own. Remember what happened after World War I? You need an organization like us. And so the complaints disappeared. The kids were taken on hikes in the middle of the night. They were given 30 pound packs and they had to walk through brush and bramble and they would get, legs would get cut up, their arms would get cut up. There was no crying. You had to be a good solid German and no crying, you did, could not complain, you, there would be no doctor to see. And they would go to a secluded area and there'd be a bonfire. There wouldn't be an American flag, there would be the German swastika flag. They would give their Zig Heils there, they could say Zig Heil there in that secrecy. And they would sing Deutschland über alles, which of course was the German national anthem. And they would sing something called the Horst Wessel Lied, which was the uh, official anthem of the SS. Additionally, the kids were sexually exploited. They wanted to create Aryans. Now, there was something in Germany called the baby policy, the Aryan baby policy, where young people were encouraged to engage in sexual relations to produce good Aryan children for the future of Germany. Similar thing went on at these camps. The, the boys' cabins, the girls' cabins were strategically placed, so they were close and the boys and girls would do what teenagers do. Well, there was a young woman camper who did not like what she was seeing here. Her name was Tilly Koch. She stood guard between the boys camps and the girls camp on her own because she felt the girls were being exploited. She got sick. She got pneumonia, which turned into pleurisy. Now they would not treat her for illness because good Germans don't get sick, obviously. Um, she died. Now, this was a major scandal. This could have been a huge problem for them. So they made her a martyr. They held an enormous funeral for her. It was a march. She was buried in the Bronx. It was a huge march through the streets. And people spoke. Fritz Kuhn spoke. Other leaders spoke. And she was given this massive funeral. The, the, their OD, as they were known, this was their version of the SS, the OD. Um, they were, they, they were the color guard at this thing. Uh, Tilly Koch's father paid for the entire thing. He was a janitor of modest meads. It, it broke him. Additionally, um, when I talk about the sex abuse, the counselors were also involved. The, the men who were leading this, the, the youth corps were also, were also sexually abusing the girls. It was not what it seemed. These kids were victims. Um, these kids were victims on a lot of levels in the indoctrination they were getting, in the sexual abuse they were getting, in the physical abuse they were getting. Now there were things called Adolf Hitler Street. 
in this in these camps. Adolf Hitler Street, uh, Goebbels Way, you know, all these different things. Um, and as you can see, there's some of the campers raise, raising a German flag. They're not the swastika flag, but the Iron Cross. Uh, you can see the lightning bolts on their arms, which of course is similar to the SS lightning bolts. And again, these uniforms are, are modeled on the Hitler Youth uniforms. You can see some kids in the background with just swimming trunks on and tents. As I say, it was, it was a camp like the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts, but with a Nazi twist, as it were. And these are some of the things that they did. Um, they had marches in the street. You can see German American Bund, Heil Hitler, I'm a member. Uh, they, you know, they had their own stores. They had their own uh, newspapers, as I said. Uh, you can see them marching through the street there with the American flag and the German flag. After the book was published, um, I heard from a woman who grew up in Brooklyn at, at the time these marches were going on, at the time the Bund was at its height. And she told me that her mother would shoo her away from the window. And she said her mother looked really scared because these Nazis were marching through the streets. Um, they had a lot of businesses. Now these uniforms had to come from somewhere. So they had tailors who were specifically making these uniforms. They had flags had to come from somewhere. All these things, they, as I say, they had a lot of businesses. They had a lot of outlets. I, again, if Kuhn had been a legit businessman, he would have been considered a genius. He would have had a multi-million dollar business going. Instead, he was a Nazi. Now, you get a lot of Nazis, you get a lot of people fighting back. Walter Winchell was one of the first people to recognize the dangers of Hitler and then the dangers of the German-American Bund. He first started writing about, and he was not bound by the you know, ethics of journalism. He had his own column, you know, one line could destroy or make somebody in his column. Uh, Broadway producers feared him because his, he, they, he could make or break a show. But he recognized early on the dangers of Hitler. So he started calling Hitler all kinds of things, uh, all kinds of names. Uh, they were really, <laughs> some of them were terribly funny. Um, he became considered a public enemy in Nazi Germany. And they published a book of people who are considered enemies of Nazi Germany. Winchell was one of them. And of course, he was thrilled and delighted about this and wrote about it in his column. His great grand, his grandfather had been a rabbi in Europe. So he was, he was an elapsed Jew, but he held, you know, some vestiges of his Judaism. And this was his way of, as a Jew of fighting back against Nazis. Uh, he spoke out of him again in his column. And then when Fritz Kuhn came into being and the German-American Bund came into being, he was one of the first people to recognize the dangers. And he's just lampooned Kuhn and the Bund in his column. It, it, they were fun to read. I spent two of the happiest days of my life in New York City at the uh, Lincoln Center for Performing Arts, the library they had there, and going through Winchell's columns from roughly 1932 into, you know, the uh, early 40s when the German-American bone went down. I went through every one of his columns looking for his mentions. Uh, that was the two days that eyewash were a big, a big, this being sold on a wide scale in New York. But it was, it was remarkable, all the things that he did, um, just making absolute fun of Fritz Kuhn. He came up with all kinds of nicknames. He called him Fritz Kuhn, uh, Kuhn Nazi, uh, the little ironist, which I never understood. Uh, the Ratsies is what he called the Nazis. Uh, Fritz Kuhn demand, said that he would hang Walter Winchell from the highest post in front of the Stork Club, which was Winchell's hangout at table number 50. He hung out. Now, one night, as I said, Kuhn was a womanizer. One night he came into the Stork Club and he was a little drunk and Winchell saw him. The two locked eyes and Kuhn relented and walked out. It was, it was quite a scene. Now, one day, Winchell came out of his barber shop. Two guys in brown shirts assaulted him, punched him in the mouth. It, it knocked out a crown out of his, his mouth. After that, Winchell started carrying a gun to protect himself. And when Fritz Kuhn came in, he had this gun. And he went into the bathroom and emptied it out of bullets because he didn't trust himself. He was so angry that couldn't come into his stork club. 
Martin Dees, he formed the Dees Committee, which was, uh, it was the House Un-American Activities before it, be, it was called the, you know, it was called the Committee on Un-American Activities, later became HUAC, which of course went after communists uh, when it became, you know, they, during the 1950s and late 1940s, early 1950s, investigating communists in the government, investigating communists in Hollywood, all those kinds of things. But before that, they formed this D's committee to investigate what was going on with these Nazis. Uh, they had all kinds of people testify. They also investigated the, um, the Silver Shirts, which was another fascist group, uh, the Black Shirts, which were associated with Mussolini, the Ku Klux Klan, of course. But the D's committee was remarkable. They did some serious investigation. Towards the end, uh, before Kuhn went down, he was he testified before them as well. He made a mockery of it. Uh, he basically just went back and forth cracking jokes, uh, dancing around their questions. Uh, he, when they said, do a swastika on your flag, he said, well, the swastika is an ancient symbol uh, recognizing you know, beauty and peace, which it is. Um, and if you go to some, like in, in Vietnam, Korea, things like that, if you find some of those old Buddhist temples and things, they have swastikas on them. And there was an old building in Chicago. It was an apartment building that I saw. Uh, it had swastikas in the tile. It was, the building was probably built in 1910. Uh, there was another, it was a movie theater, uh, the Uptown Theater, if any of you are familiar with it. It's the largest theater outside of Radio City Music Hall. Um, it's since closed. Um, they're trying to, they're trying to uh, open it up again. But when I went on a tour of this closed theater, they had a children's area where the, the, the kids could play while mom and dad were at the movies. And there was a swastika on the wall, built in the 1920s. So Kuhn technically was right, but of course he was wrong. Um, and the swastika, of course, since cannot be rehabilitated. Um, when you see a swastika, that's the first thing that goes to your mind. But he made fun of these guys. Uh, he Because Dees was from Texas, he said, well, what do you say down in Texas? How do you do? Just really mocking these guys. Um, when he was done, he said, am I done? They said, yes. He said, gentlemen, it, had been, it has been a pleasure. He stood up, he bowed, he walked out. But the next person actually to testify was a young woman named Helen Voorhees. And she told the committee about the sexual abuse and the things that went on. Um, it was quite moving. This testimony, you can find it on the internet archive. They have all the archives of Senate, of Senate and uh, con congressional testimonies and things like that. So you can find it on the internet archive. Now, Meyer Lansky, you may know him. Longies Willman, the, uh, he was sort of the Jewish Tony Soprano. He controlled, Detroit, he controlled Northern Jersey. Jewish gangsters, Jewish mobsters. There was a rabbi in, and some of you may be familiar with him, uh, Stephen Wise, who was a leader in the reform Jewish movement. I'm a reform myself. Uh, and he and a judge, later congressman, uh, named Nathan Perlman, they got together and they called Lansky in secret and said, look, these guys are out there. You guys have means and methods. We don't. Would you? And Lansky said, of course. And they said, okay, one thing, no killing. Which Lansky, of course, was greatly disappointed, but he agreed, no killing. <laughs> um, Rohn's breaking, sure. Uh, killing, no. And they said, uh, Lansky asked in return one thing, that he not be called a gangster in the press, that they could arrange for him not to be called a gangster in the press. and. They said, we'll see what we can do. We can't promise, but we'll see what we can do. So they went to work. Uh, Lansky and his associate, Bugsy Siegel, uh, they, they, they did raids on the German-American Bund, meet, Bund meetings. And uh, now normally, of course, the, the uh, mafia, you know, the mobsters, they don't take in civilians, as it were. But so many people were against the Bund, the you know, regular everyday people that were you know, fighting against these people, that were protesting them, they wanted to help. So they made an exception for these people. And uh, 
there, Bugsy Siegel had training camps on how to beat these guys up. Um, now, Zwillman has, he had an army of uh, former boxers that were called the Minutemen. They were called the Minutemen because they could be there in a minute and when they were called. And their job specifically was to go and beat up these uh, Bundists. Now, Lansky got a tip from Walter Winchell. He said, there's going to be a meeting. Actually, they lived in the same apartment building, Walter Winchell and Lansky, and they were friends. And he said, there's going to be this meeting. You guys need to go there. Now, one thing Winchell had, and he was rarely wrong, but he had the wrong address. Lansky, of course, had means and methods that even Walter Winchell didn't have. And he got the right address and went and did the job. And he later said, I really enjoyed doing this. Um, and But eventually, the Jewish press, uh, the forward, other things like that, started calling him a mobster and a gangster. And they were ashamed of gangsters. And they didn't, you know, they were ashamed of these gangsters going out and doing this thing. And they, uh, Perlman and uh, Rabbi Weiss went to Lansky and said, look, we have to call you back. And the, the regular press, the, uh, not the regular press, but the mainstream press, things, you know, like the New York Post, the uh, New York Daily News, the Times, they were calling them gangsters. And Lansky went to his friends who were on the press. And of course, they had them on the payroll. If you remember, you know, in The Godfather, they talked about having people on the payroll. He said, why are you calling me a gangster? They said, well, the Jewish press is, so it's out there. And Lansky didn't have an argument for that. Now, he, lay, you know, he was approached by his old pal, Lucky Luciano, um, and who said, look, we want to help you. Of course, Luciano being an Italian gangster and you know, Lansky, he and Lansky, Luciano and Lansky, have essentially built the mob into what it was. Uh, you know, they ran it like a business. There's that famous line from the, in the Godfather Part Two, which was from Lansky. Actually, it said, "We're bigger than U.S. Steel." Uh, and but they didn't want Luciano's help. They said, "This is our fight. Thank you, but this is our fight." And they were like golems in a sense. The the ancient uh, story of the man of clay who uh, was protecting the Jews of Prague and went in and did his business. And uh, they, they were golems in a sense that, you know, they, they were protecting of their people, even though they were non-religious men, certainly. Um, my feeling was that these guys were in a way, I mean, the, the Yom Kippur, which is the, we just had actually, is the day of atonement where you atone for your sins in, in Jewish tradition. And for me, this, I, my feeling was that these guys were, in a way, doing this to atone for their sins. And I actually talked with Lansky's grandson. Uh, he gave me some back, background and understanding of, of Meyer Lansky. And he, when I gave, you know, through that at him, he said, you know, I think you're right, which is interesting. Yeah. Mickey Cohn, of course, took care of this in Los Angeles. Um, if you find his autobiography, uh, he has a delightful story about beating up a couple of guys in jail. Uh, he was put in a jail cell deliberately with a couple of these guys and beat the living daylights out of him. Uh, there was also you know, throughout Hollywood and things like that, there were, you know, Bundists were around. And of course, he raided their meetings. Uh, he also, there were, there were in the element, uh, in the, there were some who were working in movies, in the movies. Um, of course, he controlled the unions. So they took care of the people who were in the, the movie unions who were, who were doing these things. I live in Chicago. Uh, they were here. They were very active here. They all hung out at a place on the west side called Davy Miller's Pool Hall, which was a front. And there was a guy named Jacob Rubenstein who went after these guys. And he would, he, his brother said that he would come home just covered in blood. And he was just thrilled that he was doing what he did. Uh, the name Jacob Rubenstein may not be familiar to you. He later moved to Dallas and changed his name. Jack Ruby. Yes, that Jack Ruby. All of this was in the Warren Report, believe it or not. Um, it's the only true thing in the Warren Report, I might add. Hollywood. Now, Lenny Reifenstahl, who was essentially Hitler's filmmaker, uh, Triumph of the Will, if you've ever seen that film, it was the propaganda film that she made to show Hitler as this great leader. It's a beautifully made film. It's a great film in the sense that it was so groundbreaking. Uh, every political rally ever since has been filmed in a similar way as Triumph of the Will, but of course it was to promote evil. Um, and Lenny Reifenstahl was a terrible individual, but a talented woman. She wanted to make her mark in Hollywood. So she came to America, and while she was on the boat coming to America was Kristallnacht, 
the uh, Night of Broken Glass when uh, Nazis basically went through Jewish shops and synagogues, burned down the synagogues, broke uh, broke uh, storefronts, things like that, which is why it became known as the Night of the Broken Glass. And when she came to New York and they told her about this, she goes, oh, I, I knew nothing about this, right? Um, because they got no cables apparently on the ships and there was no news apparently on these ships, which of course we all know is not true. Um, she was a uh, Hitler, I barely knew the guy kind of stuff. Um, but she wanted to make her mark in Hollywood. Well, she went to her, uh, she made good friends with someone in Hollywood. Um, she went to his studio, she showed him uh, parts of a, her film. Um, he was going to have a big screening of one of her films, um, Olympia, which was her film about the 1936 Olympics. But the union said, we're not showing a Nazi film. You could not project a film without you know, union projectors. Um, so he had to cancel it. She was grievously disappointed. Um, in case you want to know who her friend was in Hollywood, Walt Disney. Yes, Walt Disney. Um, the stories you've heard are true. Um, now, one of his animators, Art Babbitt, um, if you call it the seven old men who were founders of, uh, you know, who were the original animators and made things like Pinocchio and Snow White, stuff like that. Babbitt hated Disney and Disney hated Babbitt, um, partially because Babbitt was having an affair with the woman who voiced Snow White, um, which really got Disney all pissed. Um, now, Babbitt would sneak to the German American Bund meetings in LA. Uh, just to kind of see what was going on. Now, he claimed he saw Disney and his lawyer at these meetings. And he sent letters to the FBI saying, I saw Disney, you should investigate this. I tend not to believe it because Disney, had he been caught at these things, he was the family filmmaker. You know, he, he could have destroyed him, could have destroyed his studio. But Bab was absolutely insistent that he saw Disney there. And certainly Disney was a good friend of Lenny Reifenstahl. Now, Confessions of a Nazi Spy, Edward G. Robinson. Uh, his real name was uh, Goldenberg, and the G came from Goldenberg. It was his tribute to his roots as a Jewish actor. He got started in the Yiddish theater in New York. He made, you know, Hollywood, they were a little nervous about making films about Nazis. Um, they were still distributing films in, in Germany, and they weren't quite, again, we weren't quite sure what was going on. Um, and then a a, an employee of Warner Brothers, where this film was produced, was savagely beaten in Germany. Um, what, some stories say he was killed, others say he was savagely beaten um, and not killed. But after that, Jack Warner, uh, then the Warner Brothers were Jewish as well, changed their name as well. Um, they decided they were going to make this film. Now, it was based loosely on a FBI agent who infiltrated a group of Nazi spies. Um, they were not associated with the Bund. The Bund were too obvious to be spies. Um, but they took footage from Triumph of the Will and they appropriated it to um, the film. Now, what was Annie really Reifenstahl going to do? She couldn't really sue them. Uh, and so Edward G. Robinson played this FBI agent who went after the uh, this Nazi, these Nazi spy rings. While the film was being made, there were threats against it. There was, at one point, a, a light fell and nearly hit the director. Um, was it Bundists who were inside the studios? It's quite possible. Uh, a guard was put on Edward G. Robinson. Um, he has a very funny story in his uh, autobiography about having to go to the toilet with guards around him. And he said, that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, when the film opened, Fritz Kuhn said he was going to sue because he thought it made you know, Germans and Nazis look bad. And so he threatened to sue. Of course, he would soon have his own legal problems. So that was out. February 20th, 1939, the rally. This was the George Washington's birthday rally. Um, as we all know, George Washington was a major uh, fascist. They called him the first American fascist. Um, there were 20,000 people packed into Madison Square Garden for this rally. As you can see, there's the, so, the free American. Uh, various people gave speeches, including Kuhn. Uh, there's a film that came out called The Rally that you can find on YouTube that came out a couple of years ago where a documentary filmmaker essentially put together the footage of this and it's, it's harrowing to watch. Um, Pro-America rally tonight uh, and then a hockey game and a basketball game later is Madison Square Garden. This was uh, a close-up 
of the Washington. Um, and this was a booklet that was handed out. Uh, you know, posters were put up. There was a booklet handed out with all the speeches. Outside, of course, you have Nazis. There were 100,000 people outside protesting. Fights broke out and it was everybody, uh, students, uh, housewives, uh, Democrats, Republicans, uh, Trotskyites. Uh, there were 100,000 people. It was the largest police presence. There were 20,000 cops there, the largest police presence and something in New York until 9-11. Kuhn giving his speech. And then a man jumped out of the crowd. Um, you can see him in the lower left hand. His name was, uh, uh, now I'm blanking on his name, but he, uh, Greenberg, and he snuck in and he, his, I spoke with his grandson. His grandson said when he, he got, bought a ticket to get in there, he hid his nose because he had a prominent nose. And, you know, they, some Jews from, you know, Ashkenazi background have prominent noses. And so he hid his nose so he could sneak in um, and he jumped the stage and he tried to, you know, he tried to get Kuhn. Um, he was pulled off stage by the, S, by the OD guards um, and beaten. It looked like something out of Kristallnacht. And the crowd cheered. It was a great moment. And he was taken off and arrested. Uh, he was put on, he was, uh, he went to night court and was bailed out actually by friends and police. He paid his fine because the police all knew him. He was, uh, he worked around, he was a handyman around town. All the cops knew him. They had to arrest him, but they also bailed him out. Now, Fiala LaGuardia and Tommy Stewie. You don't have a rally with 20,000 people in New York and not get politicians mad. So they decided to go after the uh, German-American bun and Fritz Kuhn. Now they couldn't get him on what they were saying. You have a right to be obnoxious in this country. So they decided to get him on another way, taxes and finances, the same way they got Al Capone. So they looked into the finances, they looked into the taxes, and they found that Kuhn was using the money of the bund to divert it and fund his romances. Clear case of embezzlement. So they caught him on embezzlement. They brought him up on embezzlement charges. These were two of his girlfriends, Florence Camp, who he called the Golden Angel, and then Virginia Overshiner, Patterson, Stark, Blankenship, Seeger, Gilbert, Kahn, Cogswell, Raymond, and Kaplan. She was married nine times. She had a column about this, um, telling women what to do to get married. Um, she was infamous for this thing. She also claimed to be Miss Georgia and Miss America. And in a lot of the histories of the Bund, you'll see that Fritz Kuhn dated Miss America, had an affair with Miss America. Well, I, I couldn't find any record of it. I called the people at the Miss Georgia pageant. I called the people at Miss America pageant. They said, no way. She never was. Um, there may have been like a, you know, a uh, copyright, you know, a copy uh, pageant that said it was Miss America, but it wasn't the official one. So maybe she was one of those, but she was never Miss Georgia, never Miss America. So when you see the histories, that say she was Miss America. Well, I was the one who uncovered that story. Um, and it's, I've seen it in other books since mine came out, they said she was Miss America. Um, the story stuck. He was deported afterwards. Um, after he was found guilty, he served some time. And then after the war was over, he was deported um, and died December 14th, 1951 um, in obscurity, in obscurity. And uh, before he left, he, won, he sent a, uh, message through the people who were uh, the, the military who was uh, guarding him during the whole time. He said, tell Winchell, I will live to piss on his grave. Uh, and Winchell, of course, printed that in his column. And when, when Kuhn word came, you know, three years after he died, it came to America. Uh, Winchell wrote simply in his column that Kuhn had died and then the word shrug. <laughs> and that is a very brief history of the German-American Bund. Um, Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, be, where, where was he deported to? Germany. Oh, OK. And uh, yeah, back to Germany. And it's interesting because when he got there, you know, he was he went through he was arrested. He spent some time at uh, prison. And when he came out. He was it made the papers. It was notorious. Guess what? He had another affair. Um, and it was with a woman who worked at an American uh, post. Uh, she worked in the uh, canteen there in the, in the cafeteria and she was fired. And of course, Kuhn's wife said, he can't have an affair, he's married to me. 
Uh, Kuhn escaped and, uh, from prison and was finally caught. Um, and when they arrested him, they said, you know, if you had never followed this Hitler guy, none of this would have ever happen to you. To which Kuhn said, who would have thought it would end it like this? <laughs> he was a Nazi to the core. Were there other organizations wherever Germans had immigrated in larger numbers? Um, well, yeah, as I say, there was the Friends of New Germany, um, there was Teutonia, uh, Van Steuben Society, which wanted to uh, rehabilitate the image of Germany. Uh, the Bund was the biggest. I meant uh, in other countries. <laughs> oh, in other countries. Um, I'm sure there were. I'm sure there were. They were actually Mexico. Uh, they were, they had something, they think they were called the Golden Church or something like that. And they had associations with the German American Bund as well. And probably because a lot of Germans had, as I said before, immigrated to Mexico. So that's why there was a presence there, certainly. Anyone uh, want to come in with a chat question? I covered it that well, huh? <laughs> Did other people come to you after you'd written that book? with stories like the woman who's oh my goodness yes oh my goodness yes um as i say the woman in brooklyn contacted me um other people contacted me um saying that they remember these meetings uh you know that were going on that you know they they were in chicago there's there's a ger highly german area and someone told me that uh they would you know they, they would meet and drink you know at these events um, at these bars, but in the back rooms, there were the meetings. Uh, a woman, or excuse me, uh, one individual contacted me uh, who said that his friend who was in his 90s had been involved in beating up these German American Bundes. And he had heard what I was doing and he wanted to help. Uh, his friend wouldn't talk to me because he was scared. And he said he tried to convince his friend to talk to me. He said, I can't get him to do it. He's still scared about what happened. Which is interesting. Wow. Here's a question. Did the German American Bund get along or even interact much with groups like the Klan or the Silver Legion? Yes, they had. Uh, yeah, I mean, they were they were, you know, uh, of the same mind. There was. There, there were, you know, events that were held where they both spoke, uh, you know, meetings, things like that um, after. Kuhn was arrested, they, the Bun tried to get along, you know, tried to move along, and they kind of, you know, flopped around like a fish uh, that it landed on a deck, you know, trying to survive. Um, and they held a wedding of Klansmen at uh, Camp Siegfried, I believe it was. And there were protesters outside, and you could hear them, you know, yelling and things like that. But there was a wedding that was held, a Klan wedding that was held at one of the, the German American Bun camps. They, I mean, they had obvious, they had, they had similar interests. At least they were white. Yeah, well, you know, and they, you know, they both, you know, felt that, you know, Jews and blacks were going to take over the country and they didn't want that. Do you see any parallels today? Policy boy, oh boy, boy, oh boy. <laughs> There's a question. Before the book came out and before the 2016 election, I published an article in Tablet Magazine that essentially called, it was called uh, Fritz Kuhn's Celebrity Apprentice. Um, that talked about, you know, the rallies that Trump was having, comparing them to the rallies that German American Bund had, and, you know, how ridiculous Kuhn was. He really was a popinjay. And so was Trump. Now, yeah, he attracted a, a bad element, certainly. And there were people, you know, there was one infamous clip you can still find where people were protesting the Trump rally before he was went to, uh, before he was elected. And the guy was yelling, go back to fucking Auschwitz. Um, so he was attracting that element. Um, but I said, no, he's more like Fritz Kuhn and less like Hitler. And then, of course, things changed. And then there was Charlottesville and people marching, yelling past a synagogue, Jews will not replace us. Um, and then, of course, what <laughs> we've been talking about a lot lately, uh, the January 6th. And people, you could see, you know, I mean, there were people who had Nazi affiliations who went in it. Uh, the most obvious was the guy who had the, the Camp Auschwitz hoodie um, and the uh, low, under the Camp Auschwitz, it said there was a words that said, work will make you free, which was yeah, yeah. The, the American translation of what was over of the German phrase that was over 
um, Auschwitz as people entered Auschwitz. And underneath that hoodie, this is widely reported, he had an SS t-shirt. Um, and recently he was, uh, he was sentenced I, a few years in prison, I do believe. And they had pictures of him that were taken, you know, during his arraignment and things like that. He had a Nazi tattoo on his back. <laughs> are, there, are, there, are there elements? Yeah, um, I see it now. And the thing is, I think they're more dangerous now. Fritz Kuhn, you know, I mean, everybody knew where he was. Uh, he hung out a shingle. You know, they, they had these camps. People knew who, and Fritz Kuhn wanted them to know who he was. Um, today, it's more underground. And they have Twitter, and they have WhatsApp, and all that stuff. Now, remember, too, when he said at that uh, debate, uh, Proud Boys stand back and stand by. Yeah. And they wore that on their T-shirts. And then, of course, we saw what happened on January 6th. And, you know, so many Charlottesville were you know, very fine people on both sides. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of parallels. I wouldn't have said that before the election. And now it's 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 so obvious. Any other questions coming in via chat? All right. Okay, I'd like to point out one thing too. Um, first of all, my interest in this, uh, my interest in American Nazism uh, came uh, out of my teenage years. I went to high school in Skokie, Illinois, and maybe some of you are familiar with the infamous uh, Skokie Nazi march. They went Nazis, a bunch of mopes, um, and they wanted to march in Skokie. At that time, it had the one of the highest Holocaust survivor um, populations in in the world, actually. Um, and they wanted to march and people were, you know, at the city hall, uh, people were waiting for them that day. I remember it so clearly and they wisely did not come in. Um, secondly, my birthday is April 20th. Um, I don't know if any of you realize who was also an April 20th baby, um, that would be one Adolf Hitler. Um, and every time the Bundes, of course, they always celebrated Hitler's birthday. Every time they had a, uh, you know, I, I wrote about it, them, you know, celebrating Hitler's birthday, I would giggle, you know, like, like a silly little boy, I would giggle um, and think to myself, well, guess who's coming along in a few years on this day to tell your story? <laughs> oh, it, it, was, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, at times I didn't know if I was writing a serious drama or I was writing a farce. In, in some ways it was both. Yeah. Wow. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. And thanks for having me. And thanks everyone for tuning in and those who are there live. It, it, this has been a lot of fun. Appreciate it. All right, thanks again.